with this very short video, I'm going to uh, identify two particular inventions of doctrine. I might note post-biblical inventions of doctrine, which we at the Bible Church uh, deny as being valid. Uh, we do not accept them, not only because they're post-biblical, but because we do not agree that they are biblically sound doctrines. Uh, right quick before I identify those two doctrines and their origins, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to state that uh, the title of our church, the Bible Church, uh, don't assume that uh, certain other registered churches, uh, fellowships that go under Bible Church are the same as we are. We are unaffiliated. Uh, with any other church organized fellowships which uh, identify their, in their statements of faith uh, itemized singular uh, particular doctrinal views. We do not do that. Uh, at our church, the Bible church, we hold that the New Testament Bible is our statement of faith and it is our church constitution as it is written. We uh, prefer to use the King James Version Bible. We don't deny that other uh, versions are useful, such as the Standard English Version, etc. However, we use the King James Version Bible. We have confidence that it is a, a version of translation in which we can place high confidence in its accuracy as far as the spiritually uh, <clears throat> interpreted. Uh, translation uh, as holding the integrity of God's word as sacred. Uh, we view it that way. So <clears throat> let me uh, point out, excuse me, I have a bit of a cold today. A little bit of a cough thing going on. Uh, here's what we're going to identify as doctrines which we do not accept. And unfortunately, both of these doctrines are practiced in teaching by about 90% of the modern Christian denominal churches today and many churches that do not consider themselves to be denominal. The reason is is because these doctrinal views are bleed over views from the original Reformation church formations and the Protestant movement, which was kind of the foundation for the new theology uh, teaching of the modern church age, which carries down through the theological seminaries, the theology Bible schools, and just Bible schools in general sponsored by uh, your uh, organized uh, fellowships. Bible Church is not a registered uh, fellowship with uh, any governmental agency. We operate separately, church and state, completely separate from state. We honor all of the uh, laws of our country as long as they do not contradict the law of God. And that distinction is one of the reasons we do not register in any way that can control our church due to regulations uh, because there are doctrinal differences uh, in what we actually believe the Bible teaches from what is practiced in several um, laws of the national government. Now, these things are things such as uh, laws regarding abortion issues and many other things uh, such as things taught as iniquities and abominations in the Bible, which the government takes a different view in their laws. Uh, as they are constantly in evolutionary change in the national government. So th these are basically the reasons for separation. Uh, we don't register as a 501c3 because in tying up with that, it's just another way to uh, bring in outside controls into the church. We are perfectly able by the Holy Ghost to self-police and to satisfy our memberships requirements uh, in accountability towards them in all things, considering offerings, etc. So with that being said, <clears throat> let's move on to the two doctrines 
that I'm going to talk about today, in short, that we absolutely uh, deny as being biblical sound, biblically sound. The first one I'm going to talk about, <clears throat> because it reaches back into the earliest parts of the uh, Bible writings, is an invention of doctrine called the Lines of Sith. Uh, the origins of the Line of Sith theory, which uh, became a doctrinal invention, was an attempt to explain who the sons of God are in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, of course, we know uh, the Hebrew, Binah Elohim, uh, translated to sons of God. Uh, the theory, uh, that is the lines of Seth invention theory, states that the sons of God are actually the sons of Seth. Now, this theory actually assumes that the sons of God, the Benai Elohim, were sons, descendants of Seth. Well, there we go, right there. In the very beginning, this is biblically unsound. But it has deeper places that can uh, go into the Bible, which we'll do that in separate uh, explanations, that, that disqualify the theory as being a biblically sound theory. But the theory begins by stating that the sons of God spoken of here in Genesis chapter 6, which uh, tra translated from the Benah Elohim, are the sons of Seth. That is the lines of Seth invention. And that the daughters of men are actually the daughters of Cain. The giants formed in this union are the result of God forbidding the mixing of the two groups. Consequently, because of their disobedience in this theory, so to speak, God wants to destroy the world with a flood. Well, this is a, a bit of falsehood mixed in with truth, just like Satan's done from the very beginning. He mixed uh, just a little lie in with a lot of truth when he was talking to Adam, uh, talking to Eve at the tree of wisdom there in the Garden of Eden. This theory on the flood was gain, has gained momentum over the centuries and has been made popular because uh, the other alternative view, which would be uh, that the sons of God were extraterrestrial or angelic, uh, as it is written in the Bible, um, <clears throat> most commonly translated as angels, um, was very uncomfortable. Uh, to many of the early church teachers, it just uh, it opened up questions like, well, if the if it were angels and the angels were male, then there would be no need for them to be male if there were no females among the angels. But we don't know that. All that's assumption, uh, just because uh, no mention of female angels are mentioned in the Bible. But the problem is, is when we start making assumptions. And that's what the lines of Seth does in order to solve a problem of difficulty uh, in explanation. The guy who came up with this lines of Seth uh, invention first in Christian writing, and that's what we have to source. So we have to delegate it back to him as being the originator of the uh, post-biblical teaching of the lines of Seth, was a man named Sextus Julius Africanus. Therefore, we call the lines of Seth the Africanus view in theology. Um, <clears throat> Africanus lived between 200 and 275 A.D. And he was the first so-called post-biblical Christian writer that started teaching the lines of Seth view about Genesis 6, resulting in it being widely passed down through generation and generation through the Catholic Church, through the Reformation, through the Protestant movement, and it's still prominent today. Over about 90%, that's estimating, of your modern pastors and teachers have only been taught this view of interpretation, rather than just the straight biblical explanation as it stands in the Bible. <clears throat> but before I move on to our next doctrinal view that we reject, let me state that the Bible Church does not accept the lines of Seth's invention of doctrine. We deny it as being valid, 
It is unbiblical for reasons that it not only affects the interpretation of Genesis chapter 6, but also uh, has a false effect on how we would interpret uh, certain prophetical doctrines concerning things even Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24 uh, concerning the end of times and uh, last end of days. So we are rejecting it totally, going rather with a straight Bible reading, interpretation by the leading of the Spirit, uh, and we are not accepting the Africanist view as valid. With that being said, I'm going to move on to the next view, which is even more prominent and uh, stands out in almost every church. Uh, about 90% of your uh, denominal churches today, uh, Protestant churches, and the Catholic Church, of course. And that is a doctrine invention called the Tertullian Invention. It's uh, it's an invention known better as the Trinity of Persons doctrine. This invention is post-biblical also and is first recognized uh, in Christian post-biblical writing, uh, starting with a man named Quintus Septimius Florence Tertullianus, born between AD 150 and 160, somewhere in that area, and he died sometime between 220 AD and 240 AD. That's usually rounded off somewhere between like 150 to 220 in most uh, historical accountings of Tertullian. Tertullian is just a short way of uh, identifying this man. So he's quite prominent in that uh, he is recognized as the father of the Trinity of Persons doctrine invention. Uh, he was the first Christian writer to define the Godhead in terms of Trinity of persons. This is not a biblical term. Nowhere in the Bible is the Godhead mentioned three times in the New Testament ever mentioned as being persons. The only person mentioned in the Godhead is the person of Jesus Christ who is identified as the image of the invisible God in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Uh, of the 4,094 times in the King James Bible the word God is used as a term, we find the Godhead used three times in the New Testament. And in all three accountings, it is associated with being an explanation of extra-dimensional view of God. In that sense, Paul, who did a very beautiful, very eloquent uh, explanation tells us and shows us that God, the Father, is omnipresent spirit in all places, almighty, everlasting, that the Holy Ghost is the intimacy of God's spirit as it interacts with God's creation, particularly mankind, and that the only begotten Son of God the Son of God, capital S, is the Word made flesh, the actual communication of God in creation among mankind, living and walking as one of us, uh, fulfilling the role and the mission as the Lamb of God, the sacrifice of God, which covers the sins of all mankind, all those who will repent and will follow and obey Christ's instructions and the instructions of the apostles who founded the uh, church, the New Testament church, beginning at Pentecost. So we do not accept the Trinity of Persons doctrine. And if you'll look at your church statement of faith, or key points of faith, in the declaration of your church doctrine, just see if you don't find one that describes God, the one Singular God, I might point out, as being three persons. And see if you don't find that contradiction within your church doctrinal view. And if you do find that, 
uh, you're going to find you're not going to be able to change it. By all means, try. Do your own research. There's quite a bit of research to be done in the Bible, of course, that disproves this as being valid. And there's quite a bit of information and research you can find in your online libraries as well as your uh, Catholic encyclopedias as to the origins of the Trinity of, Trinity of Persons invention. Um, I'm going to tell you now, you're probably going to be up against a stubborn brick wall when you try to convert your clergy through debate or argument. Um, sometimes the best argument comes from the outside, and we're inviting you just to come out from among them and become one of us in true faith. Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity of Two Persons, of course, was later recognized as official doctrine. After the time of uh, Tertullianus uh, of the Roman Catholic Church, and it has been known as the Holy Trinity ever since, defining the one singular God as a three person um, Godhead. So we reject both the lines of Seth invention and we reject the Trinity of Persons invention. Uh, so we reject both the teachings of Africanus. Uh, on this doctrinal matter and we, his invention, and we also reject uh, Tertullian's invention in favor of how it's plainly stated in the Bible, the holy inspired word of God. And we lay our confidence in what the Bible tells us straight out. That's what the Bible church is all about. So as I close with this, even though this didn't seem like something that's all uplifting, and all the truth is always uplifting. I want to pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for each viewer, Lord, that you will deal with them in their own intelligence, and that you will anoint their intelligence, anoint their mind by the Holy Spirit, that you may lead them and guide them in all truth, as you, O Lord God, told us, O Lord God, when you were speaking in your dissertation to your apostles there before your death on the cross, when you said that the spirit of truth will lead them into all truth. <coughs> Excuse me. Lord, I pray for each listener and each viewer of this video that the spirit of truth will lead them and guide them into all truth. And that they will find you, O oh Lord, a refreshing. That they may drink of your living waters and never thirst again. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. This is Pastor Alan Childs of the Bible Church bidding you farewell until we speak again. Have a wonderful day.